But if you think that your American Catholic friends are, all agree about gay marriage or abortion or something like that, you'll be profoundly misled. Uh, even though we know what the church's view is on those matters. So maybe it's easy for a kind of rich upper middle class person like myself to say, but I, I think people should hold their identities maybe a little more lightly than they currently are prone to do, that they should recognize that they can't speak for all the black people or all the trans people or all the cis people or all the men or gay people. And that while these uh, these identities give us guides to how people are going to interact with us, they're loose guides, and the, and the more we know them, the less useful they're going to be. And now, The Good Fight with Yasha Monk. Hi, my name is Brendan Ruberry, and I'm production editor and podcast producer at Persuasion. And I recently published a piece in Persuasion titled The Future of American Sports Isn't Pretty. I decided to write this piece following the revelations that the interpreter for Japanese superstar Shohei Otani allegedly stole millions of dollars of the player's money to pay down sports betting-related debts that he had incurred to a Southern California bookie. I realized this would be a good opportunity to have a conversation about what's happened since 2018 when the Supreme Court decided to overturn a 1992 congressional ban that affected made gambling illegal outside of Vegas and a few other areas. Since 2018, 38 states, in a pretty bipartisan fashion, have legalized sports betting. It's become a massive industry. You kind of see it everywhere. I think we've been very reluctant to take a look at some of the downsides that would inevitably follow on the mass legalization of something like sports betting. One of the big assumptions was that it would be better if we brought betting into the sunlight, that we'd rather sports fans place bets with companies and corporations and do so in an open and regulated manner rather than, you know, seeing bookies who might be affiliated with the mafia. Another of the assumptions was that state governments could basically tax this and it would be a huge, massive new source of revenue for them and that it would be worth whatever social downside was inevitably incurred as a result, probably in the form of more people being addicted. I think the Otani case is important because it gives us the opportunity to do something that we haven't done so far since sports betting became widely legal and that's have a conversation about regulation and what it ought to look like. I personally am not opposed to sports betting, but I think we've been very shy about examining some of the assumptions that were used to legalize sports betting and whether it really is the best thing for all of us. My piece goes into some of those assumptions. It goes into some of the downsides. And more importantly, I see it as opening the door to a broader discussion about regulation and what this issue ought to look like going forward, because I don't think it's going away. I think it's making governments a lot of money. And I think it's time that lawmakers, the public, sports fans, sports leagues really took a hard look at what's happening here and what we ought to do going forward. So once again, that piece is titled The Future of American Sports Isn't Pretty, and I hope you go read it. You can find it at www.persuasion.community. Thanks. My guest today is Kwame Anthony Apia. Apia is a professor of law and philosophy at New York University and one of the most distinguished living moral philosophers. He is the author of books I love, including The Ethics of Identity, and he writes the ethicist column for the New York Times. We talked about the role and relevance of identity in contemporary society. I was particularly interested to understand why it is that his reading of identity as mattering a lot to how we understand ourselves and how we move in the world, but as being conducive to a form of genuine exchange and communication has gotten eclipsed in universities and other contexts by a much more confrontational notion of identity, which claims that it is very hard for us to truly understand each other across divisions measured in categories of identity. And we also talked about what it would take for universities to solve the current crisis, for universities to become places of genuine open inquiry in which people can build on their identity to connect rather than to stand in conflict with each other. This is part of a really exciting new series that I'm very excited to announce. In collaboration with the Arthur Winning Davis Foundation, 
we are going to have a series of podcasts and a series of written articles in Persuasion, thinking about how universities in the United States and beyond can seize upon this moment to reform themselves, to actually live up to the hallowed principle of becoming genuine places of intellectual inquiry, places in which a genuinely diverse student body can actually collaborate on the truth rather than withdraw into their own trenches. Anthony, welcome back to the podcast. Nice to be here again. So you've been thinking for a very long time about questions of identity. I was at a dinner recently at which somebody pointed out that when they were doing diversity work, you know, around 2010, the name that came up most often in terms of intellectual foundations of what that work should look like was Anthony Appiah. Today, when people do diversity work, often the names that come up are rather different. There might be Robin DiAngelo, Ibram X. Kendi, and, and, and others. How do you see the sort of change in the way in which the public in general, and perhaps particularly leading universities, have come to think about diversity in the last uh, decades? I mean, I think one way of explaining part of the change is, is a sort of generational thing, which is that I think maybe there's a generation growing up now that thinks that the ways we thought and acted about identity when my sort of ideas were, um, you know, widely accepted, D didn't do the work that, uh, you know, we've been doing that for a while and still American policemen are shooting black people and was, or putting their knees on their necks and so on. And so they wanted something more radical seeming because they thought that the problem was deep and it needed a radical more radical solution, that meant that they were looking for accounts of the difficulties, particularly around race, but also to some extent around gender identity and gender that were more, I would say, highly moralized and more looking for people to blame, since my way of thinking about things is about finding solutions together, not about blaming people. And so I think the, those voices, which are in obvious ways, more radical in their thinking about these things. And I am in which stress, as it were, the badness of some people rather than the possibilities of more productive relations between people might have seemed attractive. And so I think that's, that's my sort of short theory of what, of, of what's happened. So you're starting to give us a theory about sort of how this change happens, perhaps to take just one, one, one step further back. What is the difference in outlook? I think people are going to be relatively familiar at this point with ideas like Robin DiAngelo's in, in White Fragility, which say, for example, that, you know, white people are inescapably racist and that, you know, in the same kind of way in which the first step towards healing for an alcoholic is to acknowledge that they are an alcoholic, the first step towards doing less damage in the world for a white person is to acknowledge that they're going to be racist no matter what. How do the ideas that you've developed and advocate contrast with that kind of approach? Well, so I start from a general account of identities, uh, not about race in particular. And in the general account, identities are these motivating labels that we use to think about our own lives and to think about how we should treat other people. And they're the subject of social negotiation. So I don't own my labels. I share them with the other people who have the same label, but I also share them because they're part of a public discourse with people who don't share the label. So the, the label black doesn't belong to black people, the label white doesn't belong to white people, the label man doesn't belong to men, the label woman doesn't belong to women, trans people don't own trans identity. It belong, these identities belong to all of us. And we have to make them work together so that they work as well as possible for as many of us as possible. And I think I share with these more radical views the sense that a lot was wrong with the way these identities were configured in the past and that we've made progress. 
Maybe they don't think we've made enough progress, but I, I think we've made considerable progress. And maybe that's just because I'm older and I remember different times when I think it was sort of obvious that things were much worse than they are now uh, around uh, race and gender and gender identity. I mean, anyone who, you know, who's lived through the last 40 years can, has seen enormous and I think positive changes around those things. But the, the key thought though is that, is that these are subjects of negotiation, which means we all have agency. And we can make choices about how we live our identities. Our identities are not deterministic scripts that force us to do anything in particular. They affect, of course, how we interact with one another, but they don't determine how we interact with one another because we have choices to make. And so the thought that every white person is inevitably racist is one of those deterministic thoughts that I just think is is a mistake. Of course, you can overstate the power of our agency because however anti-racist I am personally, if I'm in a, in a world full of racists, what happens in the world isn't mostly going to be determined by me. But what happens in the world around me is to a significant extent uh, shaped by me. And the more informed I am about the, the ways in which ideologies are shaping my responses, the more agency I have to decide not to be left myself be shaped in those ways. I mean, I remember just, you know, years when I was an undergraduate, which is a very long time ago, you know, we were thinking, uh, I remember joining a group of uh, medical students. I was a medical student at Cambridge uh, in the early 70s that was interested in feminist issues. I, it turned out I was the only man who showed up. And in the end, I left, not because they kicked me out, but because they wanted to have conversations in which it seemed to me having a man that they had to keep looking at to check wasn't helping. <laughs> so I've been thinking about this, a long time. And all I can say is that things are much better in medicine for women than they were in the early 1970s. And that part of it is the result of conversations uh, like that, in which, in that case, women, and in, this, in my case, one man, uh, took, took some agency, uh, decided that they didn't like the way things were, and they thought together about how to make things better. I think insisting that I'm you know, sort of inevitably and deeply and intrinsically sexist isn't going to help me feel empowered to work with women and men to make the world better for all of us. One of the very basic points here is that if everybody is a racist, nobody is. But if you're encouraging everybody to claim that they are racist, you can no longer draw distinctions. If uh, Princeton University in the summer of 2020 uh, says in the voice of its president that it's a racist institution that is meant to be a form of self-flagellation, a promise to do better, but of course it also lets genuinely racist institutions of a hook because suddenly there's no longer any difference between them and a place like Princeton. Um, I think on, on the point of progress, that to me, and I argued that in, in, in my latest book, is fundamental to how you approach the world. If you are convinced that there's been no progress at all, then it's a relatively natural concomitant of that view to say, why do we need the basic principles of liberal democracy? Why do we need values like free speech? They are part of a system that has stopped us from making any progress at all. If you adopt, as I also do, the more optimistic approach, that of course there's genuine injustices that persist, but we have been able to make genuine progress, it makes you far more likely to say we can continue to make progress on, on, on the same front. But my question is about the sort of specific model of identity that you put forward in which one important element is how you are seen by others. And I've assigned your reading to classes I've taught and students always struggled with that because they thought that's unfair, right? I don't want to be seen in that kind of way, right? How is it fair that part of my social role is determined by something over which I don't have control. But I wonder whether precisely the recognition that this, whether we like it or not, is how identity works, can help to make us a little bit more critical about the role that identity might play in a healthy society. When today, in many pedagogical approaches, you have people saying in private schools in New York, for example, and I'm quoting from a Dalton website here, one of the goals of our education is to make children think of themselves as racialized beings, etc., to own the, the, the racial identity. If you recognize that that identity is something that's imposed on you by society, you might have a more critical view about what role it should play in a better society. So I guess I'd love to hear what you think is the connection between the ways in which identity is imposed on us and the ways in which we don't want to create a world without identity, but it would neither be feasible nor perhaps desirable, but, but we should always remain aware of the negative potential of those forms of identity as well. 
Yes, I mean, you know, anything interesting and complicated is going to have downsides as well as upsides, and we're going to have to we're going to have to deal with that. When you lose an election to a populist, you can feel pretty negative about democracy. Democracy produces uh, bad results as well as good results, but it, at least it produces democratic results. And in the long run, those of us who are Democrats think that it's worth, uh, with a small d, uh, think that it's worth holding on to, even though it doesn't always do what we what we want. And identities are like that. I mean, we couldn't do most of our, especially. You know, if we if we continue to live as our remote ancestors did in groups of 50 people, maybe we wouldn't need social identities. But we live in a world where we're constantly and daily interacting with more people than most of our ancestors met in, in, in a lifetime. And we need some uh, guidelines. And the fact is that this is another human turns out not to be sufficiently useful guideline because people come with indications of identity that are helpful in dealing with them. It's, it's, uh, once I know about Judaism and Islam and Jewish and Muslim identities, I know it's rude to, to serve, to serve pork to my Jewish and Muslim friends for dinner because they think it's wrong to eat, to eat pork, some of them. It depends on how religious they are. If you propose to serve pork to me, I would be delighted. Well, that's the point of course, about these things, which is that on the one hand, it's useful because it gives you broad guidelines. You should ask people whether they are keeping kosher. Uh, And on the other hand, within these large identity groups, people are enormously diverse. Uh, And so they tell you something, but they don't tell you a lot. And sometimes, just as they can be helpful sometimes, they can also be misleading sometimes. If I have a, a, a person who's Jewish by identity as a friend, and I don't know much about them. One of the things I may not know is that they love bacon, and that they love bacon trumps that they're Jewish when I'm deciding what to have breakfast uh, with them um, over. So I think there's a kind of tendency, which academics sometimes call essentializing, to treat an identity as if it it's sort of sitting there in the heart of each person who has the identity, and it's driving their lives. So, of course, their lives are all going to be driven in the same direction. But that's that's not right, uh, not only because even if I shared all my identities with, with somebody, which that's unusual, I mean, all the major social identities, I'm also me, and I there are lots of things about me that are not identity-driven. Uh, but at least as important, if I share a racial identity with somebody, I don't also necessarily share a gender identity or a, or a or religious identity, and so they'll be different from me in systematic ways as well as in individual ways. And so I think that they're useful, and and many, you know, if you are a devout Catholic, when you get up in the morning, you pray, and you think of your life as a Catholic life, and you and you commit yourself to things because they're Catholic, and that gives meaning to certain lives. But if you think that uh, your American Catholic friends are, are all agree about gay marriage or abortion or something like that, you'll be profoundly misled, uh, even though we know what the church's view is on those matters. So people, I mean, I maybe it's easy for a kind of rich upper middle class person like myself to say, but I, I think people should hold their identities maybe a little more lightly than they currently are prone to do that they should recognize that they can't speak for all the black people or all the trans people or all the cis people or all the men uh, or gay people. And that while these, uh, these identities give us guides to how people are going to interact with us, they're loose guides. And the, and the more we know them, the less <laughs> useful they're going to be because the more, the more other stuff we know about them. But still, you know, in a, in a classroom each year, I meet hundreds of new, in my classroom, I meet hundreds of new people. I make inferences about what they'll expect of me in part on the basis of their gender and their, uh, and such things as I know about them, uh, about their religious identities or their racial phenotypes and so on. And I try not to be essentialist about that. I don't assume that I know too much about them because these things, but on the other hand, I do know that in contemporary life, people can be sensitive about identity related things. So there are things I'm not going to try out on you until I know you a little bit and so on. I think there's two things in in this I'd like to pick up on. You know, one is that 
it feels to me in a deeply diverse society like the United States and like most democracies in the world now, you need a kind of double freedom. So one freedom is that you do make your ostensible identity very central to who you are, that you say, I am Jewish, and that actually uh, structures in deep ways how I want to live. Or perhaps I'm an immigrant from El Salvador and you know I'll follow the rules of a society and pay my taxes. But other than that, I really want to live in a deeply Salvadorian community. I prefer to speak Spanish or perhaps some indigenous language. And most of my friends and close associates are going to come from that group. And, and I think we need to preserve a society where that is possible, but also where people can say, you know, yes, of course I'm from El Salvador, but you know what, that's not that important to me. What's more important to me is that I'm I'm really into playing basketball and that's what I want to do a lot of my life and I'll be a basketball coach or whatever, right? Um, or, you know, yes, I'm Jewish, but you know what? I don't really care about that. I'm going to eat pork for breakfast and I don't want to be looked at weirdly for that. And one of the problems of this moment is that because we are instilling in people the sort of central importance of identity and that has become a lot of a pedagogical program is that it is robbing people of the ability to not define themselves in those ways. That if you, on your first day at university, you know, you're being encouraged or perhaps coerced to uh, engage in an identity group exercise where, you know, you're splitting up the incoming class by race, you have to define yourself by a race in that context, even if you don't think that that's central to to who you are. And, and then secondly, sort of relatedly, because you talked a, a couple of times about essentializing, I'm thinking about the role that the concept of strategic essentialism has played in giving rise to this moment. This is an idea floated in an interview by Gayatri Spivak, a literary theorist of Indian extraction, of at least she's still an Indian citizen, in fact, who has taught at Columbia University for many, many years, continues to do so. And, you know, she recognized the dangers of essentializing, but said that for strategic political purposes, we should nevertheless engage in it in certain respects. Now, she came to rue that in some ways. She said later in life that you know, the concept of strategic essentialism just became the union ticket for a more vulgar form of essentializing. But that seems to me also to be at the heart of this moment, that on many campuses and in parts of progressive left, the political strategy of strategic essentialism has turned into an excuse for a more vulgar form of essentializing. Yeah, that may be true. I know, I mean, I, I've known Gatry for, I don't know, since the 80s. And she does, I think, feel that that idea was taken up in unfortunate ways. And as you said, it was something said in passing. It wasn't, it, it wasn't a kind of uh, political proposal <laughs> that, that she expected people to take up and, and wave as a banner. It, I mean, my own view is that it's better to speak of making strategic uses of identities than to speak of strategic essentialism, because essentialism is a mistake. And of course, you know, I'm the author of a book about the role of simplification and idealization in our lives, a book called As If. And I understand that most of our pictures of the world have simplifying and uh aspects and that and that uh, a useful theory is usually a, you know strictly speaking false but i think that we can get the benefits of identity without without really mobilizing essentialism we, uh, women can work together on global feminist issues hopefully with some men without thinking that the situation of every woman is the same as the situation of every other woman or that the needs of women are the same everywhere or that the desires and the and the ambitions of women are the same everywhere, uh, or that they should be, even worse idea. So I think we should, in, in politics, there's a lot of as-ifs. We, we, we simplify things because it's too complicated in, in, in the context of actual everyday politics to, to dot every I and cross every T. And intellectuals can be annoying in politics because they're sort of sitting at the back of the room humming and hawing saying, I wouldn't put it like that, even though they actually want to do the thing you want to do, even though they're perfectly happy to vote for the bill. They're sort of privately crossing their fingers. One of many reasons why intellectuals make for bad politicians. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's uh, in part because this is a bit of a tangent, but, but you know, intellegory is to understand. And w I think genuine intellectuals are motivated by the desire to get things right, not to make things better. Of course, we are human beings, so we care about making things better. But what distinguishes us from other people is that we want to understand things in as deep a way as we can manage. And that isn't always 
what's needed in a in a, in a practical context, and that's why that's why we have a distinct vocation. But you know, even at the highest level of understanding, you're simplifying things. The quantum theory is very complicated, but it leaves stuff out. It has to leave stuff out. So I think we should not uh, succumb ever. I think to think that to the the basic essentialist thought, which is that all the X's are fundamentally the same in in all the important human ways that matter. They're not all fundamentally the same. The men are all different from each other. The women are all different. The trans people are all not the same. So the, the cis people are very various. The Americans are incredibly diverse and are different from one another and have different dreams. And that's fine. That doesn't mean you can't be an American and care about being an American. But it, but whatever it means to care about being American, it can't be a matter of hoping that everybody will be exactly an American in the way that you are. Because that, that would be that would be to deny people the freedoms you were talking about. And again, we, we, you know, we have a long history of thinking about this in relation to religious identities. We want that we've, are, we're constitutionally committed to allowing people to live a very great diversity of religious lives without making any one of them the dominant religion of our society. That's hard. And we haven't done a terrifically good job of it always. This is in descriptively speaking, there's a lot of Christian stuff about America. And yet there are lots of, uh, lots of us, um, atheists and lots of uh, non-Christians for whom that is sometimes a little bit annoying. But our constitutional commitment is that, uh, is that you can be any of those things and that the state isn't going to speak as a Christian state or a Jewish state or a Muslim state or an atheist state. Secularism is not about the state being atheist. It's about it's not taking sides among religions, including atheism, in my view. That the fact that Ezra Cornell, the founder, <laughs> the founder of Cornell said he didn't want uh, a majority of any sect on the board of his university, including the sect of atheists. I'm with him on that. So I think we've gotten to a point, I mean, there's an interesting fact, right, about, about identity talk, which is that there wasn't any before the Second World War. You can't find people talking in this way before the Second World War. So, so we used to talk about identity, but in a much more literal sense of, you know, my identity as opposed to your identity, right? Like, I, I am a distinct human being from you. Yes. So, and, I mean, that's what I would call individuality. <laughs> and in that sense, the word was used. But the idea, I mean, there's two ideas which are, I think, historically very peculiar in a way. And they, they come, I think, out of psychology and sociology in the 50s, people like Eric Erickson. One is that um, these things are very important. Well, that's, you know, sociologists already knew that gender was important and that religion was important and that nationality was important. They already knew that. But it's the thought that they're things of the same kind, <laughs> that religion and uh, gender and sexuality and nationality are things of the same kind. That's a weird thought. I mean, they're incredibly different from one another in lots of ways. Now, they do have something in common. That's, you know, that's what we theorists of identity try to figure out is, is the sense in which there is something in common to be said about them. But once you've said the things they have in common, then you must go on to say, and then they're different in all these different ways. And my gender identity isn't really of huge significance uh, when I'm trying to think about philosophical semantics. I don't care about the gender of the people I'm doing it with. I, I, I don't care about gender issues very much unless they're, unless I'm studying something to do with gender in language. And religious identities, I think, obviously can be very encompassing, but they leave lots of stuff open. And that's why we can run a society in which we are, some of us uh, atheists, as I said, and some Christians and some Jews and some Muslims and some Buddhists, and nevertheless agree that we want a social security system and that we'd like a decent public health system that meets the health needs, the basic health needs of everybody and so on. There are things we can agree about. And we can agree about them both because our identities aren't relevant to some of them and also because these are things that Christians and Jews and Muslims and Buddhists can agree about because all of them have a view of the human person that requires that we respect those things about us. Even if it's a different view, there's what Rawls called an overlapping consensus about certain matters. So that's the thought that I think is getting a little bit lost, that yes, identity is important, but they're uh, not always important. Different ones are important on different occasions. And an identity-first approach to every aspect of our lives uh, is, is silly. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, um, it flattens 
human human existence, and and that's that's an ethical point. It's also, of course, politically disastrous because if you combine the essentialism with a kind of determinism, then we're stuck, aren't we? I mean, I'm stuck in my black position, and you're stuck in your Jewish position, and apparently that's it. I mean, what's the point of conversation? So that leads me naturally into what was going to be my next question, which is about identity politics. Now, I find that that term is so broad that I'm sometimes sort of interpreted as a critic of identity politics, and I wouldn't myself put it that way. I mean, the AARP, the American Association for Retired Persons, is doing identity politics, right? I mean, being elderly is in some sense an identity. Now, I don't agree with the AARP on everything, but I think it has a pretty legitimate place in our politics. More broadly, I would say that some of the American historical figures I most admire, from Frederick Douglass to Martin Luther King, were in certain senses engaged in identity politics. Now, what I used to say before this conversation about what distinguishes in my mind the positive forms of identity politics from the ones that I'm more skeptical about is whether they were asking for inclusion under universal rules and norms or whether they were rejecting those. And what Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King have in common, but also, by the way, the successful and transformative parts of the gay rights movement of the 80s and 90s, was the demand for inclusion under universal rules. Right? By what virtue are you excluding us from the institution of marriage? How is our love different? By what virtue are you saying, because of the color of my skin, I'm not allowed to sit where I want on the bus, etc.? Right? I continue to think that that's important, but perhaps there's a second condition on what makes a positive identity movement, which is that, or perhaps the question that I have for you, you know, to what extent do you have to emphasize some similarity in order to have that kind of positive form of identity politics? Now, at the, at the minimum, presumably you need a common fact of disadvantage, injustice, or oppression. African Americans in 1880 were deeply disadvantaged, and that fact they had in common, even if they had very different uh, ambitions for their life, very different religious beliefs, very different moral conceptions. Some gay people in 1990 wanted to get married, some thought that gay marriage was a terrible bourgeois and had to a normative imposition that they never aspired to, but they both shared the fact of being uh, disadvantaged in various ways in society. Is that all the commonality you need for the positive form of identity politics? Or is there something that goes beyond that? And if so, when does that go from being a positive way to appeal to cultural or religious or historical similarities? And where does it start to be uh, essentializing in ways that should make us concerned? I mean, I think when people make demands on the state in the name of identity, there are two kinds of demands, right? One is the one you're talking about. It's to say our identity is not an appropriate basis for exclusion from some aspect of citizenship or participation more broadly in social and public life. But another is to ask, is to ask for exceptions <laughs> to, to go to the state and say, you don't mean to be, I'm not complaining that you mean to be excluding me, but if you don't allow this way of slaughtering cattle, I can't eat meat because my religion requires that meat be kosher, say. Or I'm a Sikh man, and for various reasons, it's very important to me that I don't cut my hair and I would cover it in a turban, and that means I can't wear a motor bicycle helmet. And for the uninitiated, there was, you know, half of all political theory in the 1990s was about turbans wearing motorcycle helmets. I'm slightly overstating it, but it's, there's, a, there's a long debate about this. Right. And the point is, I mean, the, I think these are, in a way, these can be interpreted as part of the first thing. Because what they're saying is, you didn't notice this, but you are actually, and maybe not intentionally, excluding us from a certain kind of participation, which, furthermore, you wouldn't exclude other people of other identities if they had similar problems, right? So, in other words, it is a demand, in a way, to be treated like everybody else. It's just that like, what it is to be treated by, like everybody else depends on what you're like, and so, and so, what you're asking for is is different, but there's. But you can say, look, if 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 a Catholic asked you for an exemption from prohibition on the grounds that 
wide is required for the mass, uh, you would you would surely say, yes, all right, that's part of free exercise, and so you would make special. It's, it's complicated, but you'd make some special exceptions. Well, that's like asking that uh, people not be allowed to sell halal meat unless it's halal. Now, I don't care whether meat is halal because I'm not a Muslim, but my, I, I don't mind that my um, Muslim fellow citizens want it to be against the law to pretend to be selling halal meat, which is something that matters to them, just as I don't want people to pretend to be selling me meat that's where the animals have been treated well, because I care about that. So I think a lot of it can be um, can be sort of drawn in under the rubric of practical equality. Uh, we're different, so what it takes to make us all equal is different. But still, the basic idea is is that is it's not that we're the same; it's that we want to be treated equally, and that may require special attention to the problems of particular groups. Now, that's that's different from the demand for inclusion, where there's an explicit exclusion, where there's segregation, apartheid, bans on gays in the military, refusals of gay marriage. Those are that they're not. I'm not saying those are the same thing, but they're sort of broadly under a rubric of egalitarian inclusion, I think. And, and that seems fine to me. I mean, I'll say one other thing, which is that for for most of us who are citizens of at least one country, and unfortunately there are people in the world who are denied citizenship of any country, and that's a scandal. But for most of us who are citizens of at least one country, there is available to us a form of identity, which is a national identity, which I think should be important to us. I mean... Uh, if you ask me why, look, um, lots of people in Mississippi disagree with me about almost everything, but I still think that we should build roads, the federal government should build roads in Mississippi, and that the uh, American Health Care Act should apply in Mississippi, and that Social Security should be available to people in Mississippi. And I know that that means that the net flows of, say, income tax in this country go from my state to Mississippi. The, the, the net, uh, New York is uh, takes less out of the of that system that it puts in because we're a rich and prosperous state. And that's fine by me, but it's only fine because they're my fellow Americans. You you have to make a different demand of me if you want me to worry about Peruvian health care. I mean, I might be persuaded to care about Peruvian health care, but it's, it would be under some other rubric. So I think we need national... That, that's one place where we need national identities. It's to motivate us to care about everybody in the nation. And that's necessary because nations are enormous and they're communities of strangers and they need some conceptual binding. And being American, being German, being British, being Ghanaian is a kind of binding. And it's remarkably, amazingly successful. I mean, I'm older than Ghana, the country I grew up in. So you couldn't be Ghanaian when I was born. And yet now there are people who care deeply about being, about Ghana and being Ghanaian. It's, it's, uh, t- t- and my father, who, who wrote a book, by the way, called The Autobiography of an African Patriot. <laughs> I mean, that was his, that was what his memoir was called. Uh, w- once wrote an editorial in our local newspaper whose title was, Is Ghana Worth Dying For? And he thought the answer was yes. That's kind of amazing because he was in his thirties, his forties when Ghana was created. He spent most of his life as something else. Italo Svevo, was born a citizen of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and ended up being one of the most important Italian novelists of the, of the early 20th century and cared about being Italian, even though he wasn't born Italian. So, so it's sort of mystery, in a way, how this happens, when it happens. And it's a very good thing, in my view, that it does happen, because how else, how else are we going to care about uh, 330 million people, or if you're Indian, one and a half billion, or Chinese, one and a half billion people, it's through the mediating idea of a shared national identity. And it's, it's a, it's, it's not a, a kind of mechanical or automatic thing. So, you know, I, I grew up as a German Jew, and so I often joke that patriotism or nationalism did not come naturally to me. But I came to very similar conclusions to you for two reasons. First, because as you're saying, there is a kind of strange alchemy to the, power of patriotism or nationalism in the modern day. And I worry that unless we find ways to domesticate it, unless we find ways to use it for good, the worst kinds of political forces are going to use those symbolic resources to use them for, for ill. But secondly, because I do think it is a very important 
part of a system of structured identities that can hold societies together. Um, certainly in a place like New York, where we're both based, uh, but also in Berlin and in Paris and uh, increasingly in, in even in Tokyo and in other parts of the world, there's great heterogeneity of people in, in, in those cities. And that's a wonderful thing. Um, it is one of the things I love about New York, there's people with many different identities in that modern sense relating to religion or ethnicity or culture of origin. But for that city to work and for the country in which it is located to work, we also need to sustain forms of solidarity with each other. We need to see similarity at the same time as appreciating difference. And so I think that um, we shouldn't think of those subnational identities as always necessarily standing in conflict with national identities. We need a healthy form of patriotism in order to sustain the peaceful forms of cooperation that allow somebody in New York to, you know, who maybe some say somebody in New England who's descended from the Mayflower and a wasp to also stand in solidarity with somebody who's, you know, black in Chicago or somebody who's Latino in LA and so forth. And of course, you've pointed out in your work on cosmopolitanism that there's a sort of third level of that uh, structured set of identities that is also compatible with that, that you can also at the same time have some sense of care about everybody in the world. And that doesn't necessarily necessitate, unlike what many people think when we hear the word cosmopolitanism, that you have to deny national bonds or subnational bonds. No, I'm the author of an essay called Cosmopolitan Patriots. And, and I think that New York provides a good example of why the thought that these, that patriotism and cosmopolitanism are intention is wrong. Because I have a strong identity as an American now, having been a citizen for um, a while. Uh, but I also have a strong sense as a New Yorker. And the, the thought that uh, strong identification with New York rules out being strongly identified with the United States would be rightly recognized by everybody as preposterous. Right. I mean, when I'm thinking about the mayor's race, I'm thinking about this city and its life. And when I'm thinking about the presidency, I'm thinking about this country and this city. I mean, the, the presidency matters for my city as well as for my country. But I don't, and the, I, I mean, of course, occasionally those things will pull apart and I'll have to make a choice. I'll have to decide what's more important, what, what, what's good for New York and what's good for the average American. And I think my view is, the same as my father's view about tribalism in Ghana, which is that when you're acting as a national citizen, you're not to be seeking to advantage your own tribe. That I have to think about New York with a kind of impartiality when it comes to national politics, I think. But anyway, but, but maybe lots of people no doubt don't think that. That's fine. My point is only that, that we can, we know how to manage this. We know how to be a citizen of a city, a state and a nation. And adding the world in doesn't add any, uh, I don't think, any um, difficulties of, of principle. Of course, the transition between levels is always a transition to something slightly different. The transition to the world isn't a transition to a system that has a practical form of citizenship. And so I don't act in the world. For example, I can't act in the world as a, democratically. I can act in my nation and my city and my state democratically, but in the world I can't act democratically because there's no mechanisms for de democratic accountability in the world except by way of the democratic ability, accountability of national governments. So, so I'm not saying it's the same, but, but there's no difficulty of principle, I think. And once you see that, then you can see that this is a point not just about the nested identities of cities and states and, and world, but about all the other identities. That they're, the, the thought that they're necessarily... So you're sitting there choosing between your gender and your nationality as you make your choices. That's ridiculous. Sometimes what matters is my gender. Sometimes what matters is my nationality. Usually they both matter to some degree, and I'm perfectly capable of, of weighing them and giving them each appropriate weight. So we've been talking mostly in our capacity as, uh, in our identity as, as, as philosophers, in your case, political theorists, in my case. Let's put on a different hat and speak in a more parochial way from our identity as academics and as member of university communities. How well or badly do you think leading American universities have been dealing 
both with the challenges that can come with different identities and the fervent beliefs and interests that can go along with them, and with the educational pedagogical mission of teaching the students a healthy attitude towards their own identities and those of others. Are universities doing decently on that count? And if not, then where are they falling short? Well, unlike you, I haven't made a systematic study of this. So all I can say is about how things, as it were, look from where, where I live. I think there are, there are mechanisms in place that encourage a kind of hypersensitivity to real or imaginary identity slights that is not good for encouraging the kind of vigorous debate that there ought to be in political life and in university life. So when I teach seminars about race and so on, I begin always by saying that we're we're going to assume in this class that everybody's operating uh, with basic goodwill and that if somebody says something that upsets you, it isn't going to be because they meant to upset you and we're going to think about, we're going to think, and we could use that fact if it's connected to identity to think about to think about uh, the, the topic of the class. So it's, it's, it'll be relevant, but we should do so in a way that... And, and, and another thing to remember when you're teaching in the humanities and, and some aspects of the social sciences is uh, fundamentally, as I say, universities are about understanding things. And when you're upset and the, the, the serotonin and the adrenaline are flowing, you may not do your best thinking. So you may want to stand back from the moment when you're upset and hold, hold hold on for a moment go away and think about when you've recovered your, yourself uh, think about what happened and then come back with it if it's relevant to the to, to the subject matter but don't immediately uh, sort of as it were let fly you know i've said that over the years to many many classes of students and almost never had anything bad happen and including recently when i think many people feel things have gotten worse and I think there's evidence that they have to some extent gotten worse because of this invitation, which is there in the language of microaggressions and so on, to be constantly alert to the possibility that somebody's dissing you. Now, you know, I read a book about honor. I know, I know, <laughs> I, I know that it matters to people not to be dissed, that being treated respectfully is an important aspect of relating to other people in a humane way. But it's hard, and it's especially hard in a diverse community such as a university. And so you should give people give people a break if they don't do it perfectly. I think, and and that is not the attitude that I detect in the institutional structures of response to student aggrievement. That's an interesting point. But in some ways, the students are better at least by and large, the majority of students, at honoring those virtues, then the sort of message they're getting from on high by the university about what the values of the institution are and how they are supposed to act. Often it is the administrators and the university that are sending the symbol that we're operating in an honor culture in which any kind of slight to you is you know, of maximum consequence and you have to litigate that through bureaucratic structures. And it's the, the students who nevertheless risk having real conversations in the in the classroom. How serious a problem do you think that that is? And, you know, how might we re- reform that if we want to go about ensuring that the university sends the signal that you send in your classroom? What could it do and what would it take for it to do that? You know, these matters of institutional culture are very difficult to manage. And especially if you've sort of gone in a certain direction, pulling back can be hard, partly because you've got a bunch of people in place who who were sort of trained in in this system and and who believe in it, I'm sure, uh, some of them anyway. But but I, 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 you know, as we're all I can do <laughs> is as a, somebody who teaches about these things is to say those things that there's something to be said for if you live in a small village in in uh, in Norway, it maybe isn't very necessary to develop a thin a thick skin about uh, about identity, uh, at least about uh, national identity and religious identity, because everybody's either a Lutheran or a post Lutheran. And everybody's and everybody's a Norwegian, and everybody's for what that matters white. 
But in a university, a modern university, which is a multicultural, multi-religious, uh, multinational institution where the faculty is international and the students are international and so on, which is true of the sort of places what you and I teach, I think a, a bit of a thick skin is actually one of the things that your education ought to teach you. I don't mean I... Look, I get upset sometimes by things people say about various things. I don't mean to say that I don't get upset, but I have mostly trained myself to think that that's, that's something to think about. And that usually when I do think about it, I can see that the person who's upset me didn't mean to upset me and that maybe I shouldn't have been upset. And that if I was legitimately upset, there may or may not be something I can say to them to help them see why. But they may not. I mean, it may just have to be that I have to bumble along in a world in which sometimes I'm upset. I think that's, you know, if you're not going to be a hermit, that's sort of inevitable in, in, in human life. So I think it's a matter of having a kind of moderate attitude, <laughs> both an attitude of intellectual humility and sort of, as it were, moral humility, thinking, look, um, sometimes I'm going to be wrong. I'm going to have a response and it's going to be a misinterpretation. I'm not always right. And I think that's honestly one of the most important attitudes I think that philosophy departments ought to encourage in their general education and in the education of their majors is the recognition of how hard it is to be right and therefore how how unreasonable it would be to assume that it's always you that's right and therefore to give other cut other people some slack about everything, but especially about these things where we're currently not cutting each other enough slack, I think. So that's that's what I would urge. I, I would urge that to be the guiding thought, as it were. That, that yes, of course, there are challenges in 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 coming together as, as a diverse bunch of people. But on the whole, especially at a place like uh, you know in NYU or Harvard or somewhere like that, there's a lot. Of, there are a lot of smart people we, we've invited here to study with us. They're here because they want to be in a place that's diverse. If they wanted to be in a homogeneous place, they could have found one. Uh, and so they're 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 ready. They're ready to deal with each other, and we shouldn't make them feel that this is a... We should recognize that, that there are systematic challenges for working-class students and for various students of various racial and religious minorities and so on, and we should think about that. But those people are here because they wanted to be religious minorities in our campus. They could have gone to a, a Muslim institution or a Jewish institution or a Catholic institution if they wanted, and they didn't. So they want to be here with us, and it, not with us, with each other. So when I, I was involved for a while when I was teaching at Harvard in, in, in the program for freshmen, and, we, and I, one of the things I always said to them in my little group, of, because we, we had these sessions with a group of a dozen or so uh, freshmen, in the first week or so, was look, look around because these are the, uh, don't look at me, look at each other. You're, <laughs> this, our power here is to convene you amazing people. So don't, don't, don't lose that. We could all leave. And just the fact that we managed to put you all together has given you a great gift and, and don't, you know, take advantage of it. So to treat our diversity as a resource, as something exciting and challenging and interesting, not as something threatening and dangerous and worrying and, and to be constantly uh, policed, I think that's an attitude that we should have, recognizing that from time to time people will actually say hateful things and that the people who've been treated in those ways deserve our succor. You know, one of the things that strikes me is that I share your judgment that most students do want to have real conversations and discussions in college. By and large, I do feel that my students are all right. The, the moral starting points are often quite different from mine in ways that might not have been true 10 or 20 years ago. I'm struck by the extent to which now the starting assumption, for example, is that cultural appropriation is, of course, something very worrisome that should be rejected in all its guises, mostly because that is the message they've received in high school, middle schools, and often elementary schools. But when you approach the subject in a thoughtful way, the great majority of them is willing to think through this in an open way, and many of them end up changing their minds. The same is true of faculty members, right? I mean, you know, most faculty members are not ideologues who use the classroom in order to proselytize and impose their views on people, though that certainly exists, but it's not the case in, in most cases. And I share your sense of the importance of recognizing that we might all be 
wrong that first precondition of a serious intellectual life is to realize that we all collectively and each of us individually may have the wrong end of the stick in some important ways. But there is, I think, a, a symmetry of fervency that is often translated into an asymmetry of power on campus because it is the relatively small ideological minorities who are the most fervent, who are most willing to use tools of whether it is cancellation or denunciation, to dominate the campus discourse, who are the ones who explain why suddenly there's a hotline to call in case of microaggressions and then there's administrators who might investigate, who explain why you know many faculty members who are not sexist or racist or any of those things live in fear of being accused of being sexist or racist by, by their colleagues or by their students or by some other member of a community. So how can people who want to preserve all of those intellectual virtues, who don't want to turn themselves into ideologues in response, who don't want to start you know, denouncing others, nevertheless robustly stand up for what the core mission of a university should be? Because if I'm thinking about why many universities uh, aren't living up to their own stated values. I think it is in many cases because of the, the, the silence and the inaction uh, of that reasonable majority and their unwillingness to take risks or overcome their fears. The, the fact is that uh, our national politics too is dominated by the ideologues and most people are in fact somewhere uh, towards the center, and most people. I mean, if it was left to the eighty percent of or the ninety percent of Americans in the center, uh, we wouldn't have an abortion politics. But we'd have settled on a set of rules that everybody was living with. But um, in the university, one of the things that's happened, which I think is that the professionalization of the academy has left the management of the university in the hands of people who may have been academics, but who have moved into a different way of thinking, an, an administrator's way of thinking. Now, there are colleagues, and they, I, I mean, they all have PhDs and so on, at least most of them. So it's not that they don't understand the academic vocation, but the, but the administrative vocation is a different one. And if you leave the university's central policies in the hands of administrators and trustees, it won't be in the hands of, of academics. And, and to some extent, I think partly because it's more convenient for, for us, we've sort of abdicated over the, over the last, really since the Second World War, increasingly, we've sort of abdicated the central role of the faculty in setting the policies of the university. Now it, uh, as in everything in American life, lawyers play too large a role, uh, but, but that's not the, and the federal government keeps making more and more rules for us. And so we have to have more and more people who interpret the rules and tell us how they apply. That's all true. And that's regrettable, I think, a lot of it. But, but the real challenge, I think, is to think about the university as something managed by academics. We make hiring decisions. About I mean, faculty hiring decisions. We don't hire deans, but we do hire faculties, uh, our colleagues. But um, you know, I, and I, I think about this because my first uh, paying job, well, my second paying job, was um, as a fellow of the Cambridge College, and the fellows ran the college. Um, the, uh, the, there was a bursar and a master, but uh, who sort of explained financial things to us. But we made the decisions. And and if we didn't want to invest in something, we didn't invest in it. Uh, I mean, not we didn't make those decisions collectively. We had a finance committee, but the finance committee was made up of academics. King's College is rich in part in the 20th century because it wisely put its fellow Maynard Keynes in charge of its investments. So there's this thing that's gone on, which is we've sort of abdicated. We've we've moved into our departments and often into our offices, you know, and and we aren't enough. I think, engaged as citizens of the university in thinking collectively. The way that happens is that members of the faculty get put on committees, and they get put on committees by deans. And the, and the deans are not foolish. They put the people on the committees <laughs> who they think will come to the conclusions that they already favor. Uh, I, I don't mean, I'm not, I'm not as cynical about it as I'm sounding, but 
But the fact is, you know, it is important for us to recognize that the university as a self-governing system run by academics is, is a, is a misleading picture of what universities have become. So one thing we could do is take it back. <laughs> and now the trustees of my university are thinking, was it a good idea to hire this guy? That is one thing we could do is, is, um, just take, pay more attention. And when things happen that we don't like, not sit in our departments complaining about what the, what the bureaucracy is doing, but go to the faculty meetings and say we don't like what's going on and that we think there's a better way of doing it and that we'd like to put together a group of faculty and administrators to think about it. Now, I'm, university, I've taught at quite a lot of universities and they're all different and they have different degrees of faculty engagement in these sorts of things and the faculty is closer to the administration in some places than others. Uh, my current university is the largest private university in the United States, so it's large and complicated and it's difficult to figure out how it's more difficult than say there are all these structures, senates and so on, but which which are mem which are uh, staffed by faculty. Uh, but um, so I think I think you know if we want to do something about this, we shouldn't just complain in the New York Times. We shouldn't just complain in our meeting in our in our departments. We should we should act as citizens of the university, and and uh, as I say. Places differ in respect of this, and I'm not saying everywhere is the same, but I feel that on average, American universities are less, American faculties have less of a sense that it's their university and their job to set the tone than I think they had even when I arrived in this country at the beginning of the 1980s. So that's one thing I would say is if this is going wrong, we can't just complain in our departments to each other that we're getting these directives from the diversity and inclusion officer that we don't understand or, or that we think are philosophically suspect. We should say that. We should uh, not, we don't need to say it collectively. We should say it as individual members of the faculty. I mean, sometimes it's okay for departments to say it, but, but just as much as it's good for us individually to complain about these things and to suggest other ways of doing it. I think complaining is most effective if you have an alternative <laughs> proposal. Uh, simply telling people you don't like what's going on isn't usually going to get much change. You have to make an active proposal as to what to do instead. And I would say that, that discouraging, um, stressing the attractiveness of the university's diversity rather than stressing the risks and the dangers of it. Anthony Appiah, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Nice to see you, Andrew. Thank you so much for listening to The Good Fight. Lots of listeners have been spreading the word about the show. If you too have been enjoying the podcast, please be like, rate the show on iTunes, tell your friends all about it, share it on Facebook or Twitter. And finally, please make suggestions for great guests or comments about the show to goodfightpod at gmail.com. That's goodfightpod at gmail.com. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Silent Partner for their song, Chess Pieces. Chess Pieces.